to go. So Steve, if you'll uh, enlighten us on addressing boiler water problems before they start. All right, I will do that, Susan, and thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and, and, and thanks very much for joining us again today as we conclude our two-part series on what I like to call the, the down-to-earth basics of, of boiler water treatment. Uh, you know, as you heard, I, I'm joined again with uh, Bill Hook, uh, an international Chemtex water treatment expert. Uh, he served many years in this industry, therefore, uh, you know, he's bringing not only the, the chemistry understanding uh, to the table, but I, but I think more importantly, uh, the practical, you know, the hands-on uh, experience that only working in the field can, can elicit. And, and this is so important because, as I mentioned last month, the boiler and system chemical treatment is considered a, a real mystery to many, and, and of course, myself included. And, and unless we understand it from a practical standpoint, the, the chances of, of executing a reliable and effective treatment program is, is greatly minimized. So our intent with this program uh, to counter that situation uh, is, as much as we can in a couple of hours of training as if we include last month's as well, uh, so to that end, um, this is what our program is going to include today. We're going to take a look at, just review very quickly the key takeaways from last uh, month's session. Uh, what causes a border water to uh, fluctuate up and down? We'll get into that a little bit. Very important for a number of reasons. Uh, the dangerous side of carryover. We all heard about carryover, but what are the dangerous sides? What can it lead to? I want to address that. Uh, the causes and costs of pressure vessel failure and repair, all tied into proper border water and system chemistry. The causes and telltale signs of, of a system upset. And then step-by-step -step remedy process. When you see these things beginning, what can you do to correct them? And then choosing, I think it's very important that we spend a little time on choosing a qualified water treatment consultant. And then, of course, as we always do, uh, Bill and I have collaborated and we have put together some takeaways, at least what we feel are important for today's discussion. And then, as Susan mentioned, we'll have the, the questions and answers at the end. Okay, so as, as mentioned, I just wanted to, to kick off today's program with some highlights from last month's webinar. Uh, in order to set a basis for today's program, while also emphasizing the important takeaways from last month's program. And we'll start with uh, just reminding you again of the elements which have to be removed from the border feed water and the border water itself to avoid problems. You see dissolved minerals, uh, including the hard scale formers and the, the totally dissolved solids. And of course, we, we cannot forget the, the highly corrosive gases, uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide, because you know if we, if we neglect accounting for these nasties, uh, you can readily see what can happen just by looking at the pictures on the right. But you know, there are other problems which can occur if these elements are not controlled, and they result in carryover, which besides being harmful to connected equipment and processes and piping, uh, it can be extremely dangerous too, and I'll get into that. Now, when we refer to carryover and the potential causes, they can be broken down into or under two basic subheadings. We have sink and swell and foaming and priming. Now, we'll start with sink and swell, and its primary cause, which is a change in ratio between the water mass and the vapor content. The vapor content being the steam bubbles forming as the water begins to change state. And as this happens, the water volume in the border begins to rise only slightly above the, the normal level as depicted by this blue line. And, and then as, as the steam forms and, and exits the nozzle at the top of the boiler shell or the drum, the volume drops and, and triggers the pump control switch in the low water cutoff to close and start the boiler feed pump. This happens, of course, before a low water condition occurs, which would, as you know, break power to the burner and shut the boiler down. Then there are conditions wherein the, the system pressure drops really severely and suddenly, which, 
which causes the steam bubbles to expand rapidly, increasing the volume so that the border water is carried into the main steam line, and that is called carryover. And oftentimes when this happens, the, the, the feed pump cannot keep up, and the boiler experiences a low water condition causing the unit to shut down. The total phenomenon of the rapid rise and fall of the boiler feed water is therefore referred to as sink and swell. Now, to counter this from happening with, with certain processes with variable swings in demand, uh, many consulting engineers recommend a three-element feed water system be employed, which is often integrated within a PLC-based burner management and combustion control system platform, as is shown here. Now, the three-element feed water system uh, includes a level sensor in the shell or the drum of the boiler. This happens, as you can see, to be a water tube boiler in the schematic. And then you also have a feed forward steam flow transmitter, which senses the demand increase or decrease, and then sends the signal to the third element, which is the feed water regulating valve. Now, this control scheme largely mitigates the rapid swings in level, which causes carryover and nuisance shutdowns uh, due to a low water condition. So what I have spoken of so far is carryover as it relates to sudden swings in steam demand. But there's another cause, and it's referred to as foaming and priming, uh, where the result is really the same. Water being carried into the main steam header causing serious problems, including, you know, personal death or injury, which I'll address in a minute. This is an inside shot of a fire tube border with a probe type level sensor extending into the water, and you can see the steam outlet located above it. Now, note the foaming and the priming occurring at the surface of the water, reducing its tension. Now, this will increase as a result of the increased solids forming at the, at the water surface, especially contaminated condensate, which might be containing things like alkali, oils, fats, greases, and, and certain types of organic matter and suspended solids. But the result is the same, carryover into the steam main, and at times it can be considerable. Okay, so why is this a big problem? Well, actually, several reasons. And the first is the loss of the energy efficiency of the steam to the process. And secondly, the carryover and its contaminants can severely damage heat user equipment, such as superheaters and turbine blades. And thirdly, it significantly adds to the cause of dangerous water hammer. All right, so what is water hammer? and how do I diagnose it? Water hammer is the result of water sitting at the bottom of the steam pipe with steam passing over it at speeds often approaching 100 miles per hour. Now this velocity moves the liquid. It moves it along much like wind blowing over a lake, propelling the waves to the shore. You know, the higher the velocity, the larger the waves, and the speed at which the waves arrive at the shore. Now, to combat the problem, steam lines are equipped with drip pockets to catch this condensate, but if the amount of saturated water exceeds the capacity of the pocket or it is sized too small to begin with, this happens. A slug of water can wave up, actually plugging the pipe, speeding the water down the main at speeds close to 100 miles per hour. Now, be mindful, this main could be 14 inch in diameter or even larger, meaning the slug of water could equal a couple of gallons. In other words, it could be like a bowling ball rocketing down the pipe, and when it hits a 45 or 90 degree angle or a weakened section, bang, the section of pipe literally explodes, and much of that saturated liquid flashes to steam and expands 1,600 times, causing serious injury or death to those unfortunates in its destructive path. And that's to say nothing about the property damage, uh, property damage that's incurred. So water hammer is extremely dangerous. 
And that's exactly what happened in New York City on July 18, 2007. Though it was a much greater slug of water when, than, was, uh, than compared to a bowling ball, it was thousands of pounds of force hitting a weakened pipe section, which in turn ruptured allowing hundreds of pounds of hot liquid to immediately flash into steam, blowing a huge crater in the midtown Manhattan street, sending a tow truck about 20 feet in the air while scalding the driver over 80% of his body with 400 degree steam. You know, people in the area scurried for safety, thinking it was another 9-11 terrorist attack. Several more people were injured, and you know, one person died, unfortunately, from a heart attack, just out of sheer fear. So, how do we determine if water hammer might be a problem in our own facility or in our plant? Well, you know, it's really quite simple. You listen and you observe if pipes in the plant are banging or shaking. This, my friends, is not normal. This means you have water hammer going on, and it needs to be corrected immediately with proper control of the water level in the boiler, properly sized drip pockets and traps to rid the condensate from the steam line. And failure to do so can be regrettable. All right, we're back to the impurities in the water, which can affect the, the boiler and connected system. And we just talked about the various dissolved salts, which can cause water level problems, but as, as you know, and what we talked about last month, is, there, is that these particular dissolved salts can be scale formers too, which could cost us downtime and repair costs. And that's what you see here. And as was mentioned before, the remedy is a combination of water softening and chemicals. A sound water treatment program will use both to affect the best possible outcome for the boiler and for the connected system. And lastly, we need to concern ourselves with the dissolved gases, with the, the main culprit being dissolved oxygen, which can eat away at boiler tubes very quickly and aggressively, and forming blisters on the tubes under which you will find pinhole perforations right through the tube. The best answer, well, again, it is a two-part approach with a deaerator to remove oxygen and carbon dioxide, and of course, chemicals to clean up the aftermath or the, any residuals that would be remaining. Because if you don't address the corrosive gas problem, this is what we have to contend with. And if we don't properly address the scale formers, this is what we get. And it all leads to very costly repairs and downtime, which in some situations can be more expensive than the repairs themselves. The downtime can. For instance, here is a, a 500 horsepower fire tube boiler, which is requiring all the second pass tubes be replaced because of excessive scaling, which caused the tubes to overextend, tearing them, tearing them loose from the welds to the tube sheet which then caused excessive leaking. Now, be mindful, that's 110 tubes in this second pass requiring two men at a nominal, let's say, $50 per hour and one hour per tube. Now, if you do the math, that's $11,000, not including the cost of downtime. Then you have the other costly problem when you have a leaking boiler and that is the, the damage to the door's insulating refractory, which got wet, the water turned to steam and expanded, causing large cracks and chunks of this refractory to fall out, meaning the refractory had to be replaced or repaired, and maybe the door had to be replaced too because of overheating and then resultant warping. Thousands of additional dollars are therefore added to the repair. And also understand, that any field repair of this type needs to be inspected and approved by a qualified inspector who is sanctioned by the National Board of Boiler and Pressure Vessel Inspectors who require specific and rigid standards and procedures that they be followed or the repair will not be approved. This includes specific weld material depending on the repair, be it a tube, 
tube, the ligament attachment, furnace repair, and so on. These welds then require stress relief, normally using a torch as shown in the lower right-hand picture. The heat has to be applied gradually and uniformly until it reaches a temperature of about 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit, or it has a, a dull red glow about it, uh, which needs to last for a period of one hour per inch of metal thickness. So, so again, these repairs are time consuming and very costly. And as I said before, this has nothing to do with the downtime costs associated uh, with a loss of production because the border is down for an extended period of time. Okay, enough for my review and, and set up for the, the real meat for today's discussion. Now here's Bill Hook to tell you the rest of the story. Bill? Steve, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, thank you very much for the uh, gracious introduction earlier today. And I must say that the idea even of a 16-pound bowling ball traveling through a steam pipe at 100 miles an hour creates an image of enormously destructive potential. And relating to that, part of my presentation today will focus on carryover its causes, uh, ideas and tools you might use to identify it, and repercussions and solutions to consider once it has occurred. Um, I'll speak briefly on boiler layup options, and finally I'll talk about a few things to consider when choosing a water treatment supplier. But first I want to review some water treatment basics, which is not to be talking about tur polymers, phosphonates, or coal polymers, or DHA, or hydrazine, or, or any other chemistry. Specifically, I want to talk about um, basic practices and procedures meant to assure operational efficiency and protection of that capital investment that's been made in the boilers and the related equipment. And uh, just as a reminder that uh, the majority of this presentation is directed at boilers operating at uh, less than um, 300 PSI. Uh, Susan, I'm not able to pop down here on my presentation here. Um, click on the screen, Bill. Yeah, click, click on, the, on screen. the screen and then move forward. How about that? There we are, understanding the basics. There we are. Thank you very much for your sage guidance here. Anyways, Steve alluded to this before, and I'll allude to it again, is that as we've done everything we can to control the hardness and iron entering the boiler with proper pretreatment, and during the course of the year, we've maintained the plant's specific boiler chemistry, including the conductivity alkalinity and sludge conditioner to minimize the amount of scale that forms in the boiler. But when we open the boiler up, sometimes we don't see what we really expected to see. We don't see the boiler on the right, we see the boiler on the left. And so what we want to talk about is what could possibly have happened when we were um, running an effective water treatment program and my boiler came down and it looked like this. Well, when it happens, what you want to do is Check the pretreatment systems, the softener, especially at the end of a cycle. At the end of a softener run cycle, this, the resin is exhausted and hardness coming out of that softener unit will go up very quickly. And don't merely check the makeup water. It's important that you check the feed water also. And check the feed water for hardness and iron. And make sure that, because if you're not, any condensate returning from the, the system that's got a hardness leak coming back to it is going to be undetected if you're not testing the feed water. And the last part of this testing aspect of it is make sure your testing reagents are good. Are your test results matching those of your water treatment supplier that comes into your facility on a regular basis? Because if you open your boiler up and it's got scale in it, there's a possibility you can have a tube burst, a tube failure, it can result in downtime and and costly repairs, which Steve alluded to before. 30 years ago, engineers used to always like a little bit of eggshell scale in their boilers, but that was before the energy crisis and the efficiency was any kind of a concern. Natural gas was 20 cents a therm or even 10 cents a therm. So we want to keep the boilers as efficient and clean as possible, and we can protect them with proper scale and corrosion inhibitors so that you maintain maximum efficiency without the energy loss through that eggshell scale. 
The other thing we've done is we've minimized the oxygen entering the boiler with a proper functioning deaerator. We've maintained oxygen scavenger in the boiler all the time, but we open the boiler up and the boiler is inspected and we find all kinds of oxygen pitting in the boiler, which can result in a failure of the tube with a pit going all the way through. And again, I'm gonna come back and talk to this frequently as I did last month, talking about maintaining oxygen scavenger in the boiler all the time. And that includes testing the boiler for a confirmed oxygen scavenger residual when the boiler is idle and when the boiler is running. Um, idle boilers are frequently ignored and the result is you've got 10 or 11 months of effective treatment taking place, in which case the other month that standby boiler is subject to severe oxygen pitting. And we're gonna discuss a little bit more about that when we talk about wet storage of a boiler a little bit later in my presentation. So we got the boiler protected now, and we've done everything we can to minimize the carbon dioxide generated in the boiler, reducing the potential for carbonic acid to form and return and corrode the condensate system. And at the same time, we've employed proper chem condensate treatment to protect against the carbonic acid that does form. We've tested and we've tested and confirmed the pH, the iron, the hardness and the conductivity, and they're all within limits on our condensate system. And we've recorded these test results in our log sheets. And we've tested the condensate from different areas of the plant, near and far, because different condensate treatments have different chemical properties, and they'll protect different parts of the system plant. I've listed three different amines which are typically used in industry today. These are volatile amines which go out with the steam and when they recondense, they neutralize carbonic acid which may be forming in the condensate. Morpholine is one that is providing protection most generally near steam generators and around turbines and close to the boiler plant. Diethylaminoethanol provides protection a little bit farther from the plant. And if you've got a large plant, you may need to employ cyclohexylamine to ensure that this volatile amine travels all the way out into the plant and provides protection against carbonic acid corrosion throughout the entire facility. And today, blends are used most often, our blends are used um, to provide protection to the complete condensate system around the entire facility. And when you are doing your testing, you want to make certain that you're testing different condensate receivers around the plant because only testing one receiver can oftentimes indicate that other, can oftentimes um, result in other areas of the plant not having condensate protection. But by the time the, all the condensate comes back to the boiler room, it's diluted by the properly treated condensate and the problems don't show themselves. Um, the other thing is that I think it's always worth mentioning, you've inspected the boiler, why not inspect the condensate line? Look to see if there's a groove starting to show in the bottom of your condensate pipe and look in different parts of the plant. Oftentimes there's a flat run of pipe right near a condensate receiver, which would allow you to uh, inspect the condensate line because there's a union right there and a horizontal run of pipe that would allow you to inspect that piece of pipe. Be proactive. Without proper condensate treatment, the action, the results can be like this. And I still think this is a funny picture with all these different, there's like 10 wraps on one horizontal section of condensate pipe. Not only is there condensate loss and the energy associated with that, but you've got more makeup to consider and you also have to consider the fact that you've got um, the costs to free treat the water. So that's a real overview of some things that you can do to protect your condensate system, your boilers with basic, simple water treatment direction. And Steve alluded to carryover, and this is an important thing that 
in my years of experience, I've talked to so many different customers about this that it's definitely worth spending some more time talking about. And obviously the effects of priming and surge and sink and swell that Steve talked about, our boilers can be shut down on low water cutoff. Uh, you can have water hammer, which can destroy piping and be dangerous to personnel. Processes can be shut down if they're flooded with wet steam or the, or the system shuts down on low water cutoff. Product, if you're, if you're generating steam to heat a product with steam, the product can be contaminated. It needs to be thrown away, and there's a cost associated with that. And it's always worth mentioning that carryover causes more carryover, and we'll talk a little bit more about that also. But let's talk about some of the possible causes of carryover, and, and we'll go through a few of these, and hopefully this will uh, ring a bell from something that might have happened in a plant that you've been associated with. Obviously, pressure drop is one. Steve alluded to water level issues. There's always the opportunity for contamination coming back from a condensate failure, from a heat exchanger failing and bringing pro some sort of process material back to the boiler. And, of course, chemical feed is another source of possible carryover and priming in a boiler. While working for BETS, a study was done with a thousand incidents of carryover were studied in the field. Of this study, of a thousand incidents of carryover in the field, 95% were proven to be caused by mechanical problems. While chemical control is important and it can and will cause and contribute to carryover, it's not always the problem. And here's in a very simple diagram and, and procedure, here's how in a low pressure 20 PSI system carryover can occur. I got a 20 PSI boiler operating in the liquid and the vapor in the boiler and the steam section are both at 259 degrees. There's a sudden drop in pressure. Now I've still got the 259 degree steam, but I've got carryover that's taking, I've still got 259 degree water, liquid, and steam in the system, but the pressure is only 10 PSI, and water now boils at 239 degrees. So the liquid in the boiler suddenly flashes from 259 degrees. It can't exist as a liquid anymore. It's going to flash to vapor, and when that happens, that pressure drop results in enormous amounts of carryover. And this is another example of carryover in a plant. I want, to peel a, I want to peel a potato. I want to peel a lot of potatoes. So I put the potatoes into a peeler. And a peeler is a room-sized vessel that's pressurized and filled with high-pressure steam, let's say 170 PSI. Steam surrounds and soaks, soaks, cooks the outside of the potato at that 170 PSI. Suddenly, the pressure on the peeler is released. It goes to zero, and the potatoes are soaked in this 175-degree steam. The water that's soaked in this steam, the liquid in the outside of the potato, can no longer exist as a liquid. It's going to change to a vapor. And what happens, this causes this peel, this outside of the potato, to explode, and the peel is actually blown right off of the skin. The skin is blown right off of the potato. So that's, that's exactly what's happening inside the boiler, is that the liquid that's in the outside of the potato is blown off as the pressure drops. The next thing that happens, the next thing that happens is that when that room-sized peeler calls for steam again, the pressure drops in the boiler, the boiler water level drops down, and the boilers were shutting down on low pressure and low water. So what they did, as Steve alluded to earlier, they went with a three-element feed-forward feed forward system. That's easy for you to say. When the peeler is ready to call for steam, the feed water pumps preemptively came on and began feeding feed water to the boiler prior to the water level control signal. So again, this is an actual real application of what Steve was referring to when he talked about the three-element system. The other source of potential for carryover is contamination. 
and the, and the contamination can come from oil. It can come from the process side. You could have something like milk coming back into the boiler, which is going to increase the suspended solids in the boiler and cause carryover. Another frequently found cause of carryover in a boiler is CIP chemicals. In the food process, CIP chemicals are used to clean the equipment that's using steam on one side of a heat exchanger to clean the food side. And if that heat exchanger leaks, those CIP chemicals come back into the boiler. It used to be the CIP chemicals contained phosphoric acid and they were very easy to detect. That's no longer the case, but these CIP chemicals coming back into the boiler is basically soap coming back into the boiler, which causes carryover in the boiler. If you put soap into your teapot on your kitchen stove, look and see what happens. Another thing that can cause carryover in a boiler is, is a hardness surge. And if you see a hardness surge in a boiler, oftentimes the boiler water will turn cloudy and milky and you'll have like a suspended sludge in it if your water treatment program is working effectively. And if you've got an all polymer program, sometimes these excessive levels of hardness can overwhelm the um, all polymer program and result in a um, plastic formation um, taking place and acrylic calcium acrylate forming in the boilers, which is very difficult to remove. But anyways, overfeed of chemical can also result in carryover in a boiler. And while um, these are very common things to see, you can see there's a lot of different opportunities to cause carryover in a boiler. Certainly from a chemical treatment standpoint, high conductivity can cause carryover, high alkalinity can cause carryover, or a sudden surge in suspended solids from high hardness or high chlorides entering a boiler from malfunctioning pretreatment system, bringing a bunch of salt water into the boiler, can increase the suspended solids of the boiler and cause carryover from that. Another thing that sometimes causes carry is an overfeed of condensate treatment, the amine, because the amine all wants to vaporize at one time. So if you've got a small boiler plant and you're slug feeding your amine to the boiler, when that amine is all trying to flash to steam at one time, it's oftentimes going to cause carryover. If you see deposits in regulating valves or in condensate and in steam traps outside of the boiler room and they look um, crystalline in nature and they look like you might find them in Carl's Bad caverns or something like that. It's entirely possible that those deposits are a result of amine carryover and it's a cyclohexylamine carbonate or a, a carbonate forming from the amines that are being fed improperly to the boiler system. And in review, again, I'm going to go through this again because in my career I've gone through it so many times with so many customers is my boiler's operating just fine. I've got no problems going on, no carryover, no issues. Suddenly I have carryover. Um, was there a sudden drop in pressure? Is there um, something going on in the plant that's different, that's, that's, that, that's taken place in the past? Um, immediately go and look at your condensate source to see if you've got contamination coming from your condensate. Is, is the is the contamination, is the source of carryover um, coming from a piece of equipment that's being cleaned on an intermittent basis and now somehow it's leaking and that CIP chemical is coming back to the boiler. Another time when it might occur is early in the morning in, in an industrial plant where the steam is used for process or for heat. If everyone goes on break and comes back after break and turns on all of their process equipment and all of a sudden there's a large demand for steam and the pressure drops in the boiler because everyone's turning their equipment back on at the same time, that equipment may have to be staggered every even five minutes will give the boiler a chance to catch up in terms of the level control and the pressure that's necessary to maintain pressure and steam levels. Um, I've seen carryover take place early in the morning in a large commercial facility, facility when the entire system calls from going from 60 degrees at night to 75 degrees in the morning just to heat the building up. The whole system turns on all at one time and there's carryover.
And obviously, was the chemistry in the system out of range causing the carryover, or did this happen immediately? The lesson to be learned here is take a look at the boiler chemistry, not just in the boiler, but look at the chemistry and the condensate as well. If you've got a little carryover in the boiler, the boiler water is going to show up in the condensate, but typically not too far from the boiler unless you have a real problem. And let's talk a little bit about contamination and carryover can, and how carryover will cause more and, co and contribute to even more carryover. In this particular example, my feed water's got a conductivity of 100 and my boiler has a conductivity of 3,500. I'm operating at 35 cycles of concentration. Now, when I have carryover, suddenly my feed water conductivity goes to 700. I've got minimal blowdown, about 3% going on in my boiler prior to this carryover. And now, for me not to have carryover or have very high conductivity in that boiler with the 700 conductivity feed water, I can only run five cycles of concentration. So the system is set up to operate one way, and when you have carryover, it, it causes more carryover, and until you remedy that situation, it, the potential for even further carryover and more contamination and more problems continues. So what's the solution? The solution is to dump the feed water and or the condensate to slow the carryover and replace that tainted water with fresh makeup. If oil is determined to be the cause of carryover, additional OH alkalinity is going to have to be added to the boiler to tie up that oil and saponify it and get it down to the bottom of the boiler where it can come out. And as much as I'd like to, I'd like to have a better solution than basically dumping and flushing from the system. This is the main way to stop the carryover. Some antifoam can be added to the system, but basically the solution is to dump the system. I'd like to move on to something we've alluded to in the last section, and that's the importance of log keeping. And again, I'm not going to set specific limits up for each facility and so on and so forth, but I want to talk about what you should be testing and what your water treatment advisors should ask you to be testing for, depending upon the size of your plant. Are you testing your makeup water for hardness, conductivity, and are you tracking the makeup water going into the boiler? On the feed water, you also have to be testing the feed water because you want to make sure that there's zero hardness going into the boiler, that the conductivity of your feed water is relatively consistent, and the alkalinity the same. You want the alkalinity to be consistent. If possible, if you've got a meter on your feed water, it's very valuable to have that information as well. And on a feed water, because it's a combination of condensate and makeup, you want to make certain that you're testing the iron as well. In the boiler, you want to monitor, monitor neutralized conductivity, alkalinity, and sludge conditioner, as well as oxygen scavenger. At a minimum, you want to be maintaining that. And I recommend that you maintain and monitor the inventory of the sludge conditioner and oxygen scavenger to make sure that they're really going into the system and there isn't some interference being caused by some of the more sophisticated testing that's done in the system. And the big thing is, another thing is that you want to make certain that you're on the lookout for changes and upsets. And while you're on the, the uh, idea of looking at changes and upsets, what you want to do is you want to immediately be thinking about cause and effect. In this particular example, you're identified that you're making, that your system is out of limits and you want to move your systems back into limits. You want to make small adjustments to the bleed and feed of the system generally. And you want to record those adjustments and you want to record the water use so that you know what you've done to make sure that the program stays in line. And most water treatment companies will provide you with a water treatment manual which provides you with direction as to what to do if your sludge conditioner is too high, what you should do. If your conductivity is too low, what you should do, and so on and so forth. That information should be readily available to you in your plant at all times.
And logs are critical because logs show operators other than yourself what actions have been taken. If you find the conductivity is high and you increase the surface blowdown, and the next operator comes on shift and he finds that the conductivity is high and he, he increases the blowdown, pretty soon you've taken a major step where only a minor step was, was necessary. So logs are very important to document what actions are taken. They're also very important to track and prevent inventory mistakes. This is an example of a operator log that shows what an operator might test for in his facility. This document provides administration and yourself with protection because if you haven't documented any actions that have taken place, they really didn't happen. So on this, case, on this slide, you can see where the different limits of our program are outlined. You can see that we've got a conductivity limit set up here. We've got iron and sulfite recommendations that are outlined here. And we've got specific guidelines for the condensate program as well. Now, when the operator puts his tests in on this program, the operator will input the data, and when the data is input, it will change colors if that information is out of the control limits. In this particular case, you can see the conductivity of the RO water entering the boiler room is slightly high. It turned yellow. But we can see the condensate pH is 7. It's far below the recommended limits. It turns red, and it gives the operator a heads up is to something's not right and action needs to be taken. The new testing capabilities gives us the opportunity to trend information as well. It gives us insight into operating changes which allow us to predict and prevent greater problems. In this particular case, on September 14th, the average makeup going into this boiler went from someplace around 60 gallons an hour to well over 100 gallons an hour all the time. What happened? Again, notice the importance of log keeping. Don't just write the test results down. If you see oil in the sight glass, take notice. If you see your sludge condition, if you see sludge in the boiler water, take notice. What could have caused that? If you've seen a makeup water use change, what could have caused that? What could have caused your condensate and feed water characteristics to change? It's so critical that you notice the changes, that you confirm them, that if you've got any questions, you retest and you explore to find out what caused these problems. Because if you don't take action, if you don't notice that the, there's oil in the side glass, if you don't notice that there's a change in makeup use, you can end up with failures. So what is the importance of log keeping? First of all, the tests must be done. Second of all, it allows you to show trends moving outside of the prescribed limits, and it allows you to notice it. And then what it requires is you need to think about it. What do you do? You need to make an adjustment. More often than I'd like to say, there's been operators where I've gone in and says, yep, I've had sulfite in my boiler, but I haven't had any, I, I'm rather, I haven't had any sulfite in my boiler for the last three days. What should I do? Make an adjustment. If you see a trend that's moving outside of the recommended limits, make a adjustment. And if you don't know what to do and your program manual doesn't notice, doesn't tell you what to do, call your water treatment supplier. Again, this is very basic overview of a water treatment program and applications and so on and so forth. But the this examples I used are specific. And as promised, I'm going to talk a little bit about boiler layup because this is a very important part of protecting the boiler the entire year. You got wet layup and there's dry layup. On the wet layup, what happens is you maintain the sulfite residual of between of about 100 ppm, and you want to have 400 ppm of P alkalinity in the boiler. But what you also want to do is you need to warm that boiler up to circulate that water around to ensure that you have protection in the entire boiler, not just, not just settling into the bottom where that 
uh, oxygen scavenger has settled. And this procedure should be done regularly and judiciously because you want to protect the boiler 12 months a year. In the old days, you used to put a desiccant in a tray inside of a boiler. And when it came time to fire that boiler back up, you had to open the hand, open up the manhole, take the tray of desiccant out, remove the desiccant, close the manhole back up, and then fill and fire the boiler. Now, under those dry layup conditions, the, um, I'm sorry, that was dry layup conditions I was talking about, putting the silica gel in which absorbs moisture. Now during the dry, dry layup conditions, there's material and bags of gelatin bags that you can put right inside the boiler, and when, they, uh, when the, you button the boiler back up, and when you're ready to go, you fire and fill. But which one's better, wet or dry storage? Well, every facility is a little bit different, and every application is a little bit different a little bit different, and you need to take a look at it. Wet layup allows for quick turnaround, but you need to warm the boiler regularly to make certain that you're circulating the water or put a cascading blowdown system in or a circulating pump. You can ask your water treatment provider about that. And you need to maintain the water level while you're doing it because oftentimes there's leaky headers on steam headers which cause condensate to collect in the boiler causing dilution of your oxygen scavenger and alkalinity builder. And when it comes to boiler layup that's dry, it takes a little bit longer to fire the boiler up. It also demands that your steam header must be closed because you don't want water dripping back into the boiler. And this is recommended for longer term layup, two months or longer, or seasonal layup where the system is down for the winter time. Quickly, the last section that I'd like to talk about, which is very important, but shouldn't be overlooked, and that is how might you choose a competent water treatment supplier? First thing is you need to evaluate what your needs are. The next thing that happens is when you do your inspections, what do your inspections look like? Because your inspections are your water treatment company report card. Are your water treatment vendor at your inspections? Are they taking pictures and sharing them with you? Well, there's a couple of things that you can do to evaluate a water treatment supplier. Is one, does your water treatment supplier have experience? Do they have depth? Do they have many years of experience in the field? Um, if your rep gets hit by a bus, who's going to help you? If and can your representative um, help you in a reasonable length of time if they live six hours away? Uh, is that adequate? Maybe it is for your plant. And again, is the rep worthy of your business? Is this the first plant the rep's ever been in? Are you training a new rep for a water treatment company that you've had for a long time? Next is the education of your water treatment representative. How does the uh, representative have education related to the field? Does he have experience and aptitude? Um, there's a thing called a CWT, which is a certified water technologist, and that's a degree given by AWT, which is the Association of Water Technologies. So the organization was actually co-founded by the founder of International Chemtex, and it's an uh, international organization of water treatment companies um, that specializes in applying water treatment to industrial and commercial and heating and cooling applications. So does the rep have a knowledge and experience in your system? Can they share a similar application to what they've encountered? The next and maybe last most important thing is, does your, rep does your representative understand the costs of a barrel of chemical? Does this understand the cost for a barrel of, barrel of chemical is unrelated to the cost of a competitor's barrel for the same stuff? These are two different automobiles, but they are not the same. Does the representative realize that the cost of chemicals represent a very small percentage of the operating utility? And if inexpensive, cheap chemicals end up with your boiler inspection look like that, then you're really not getting the water treatment program that you deserve. The last part of a water treatment program that you should consider is product handling. How is the product getting to your facility? Are you buying in pails or drums or totes or tanker cars? How will the product arrive and will you manage the product and how will you manage the product from the supplier 
to the use point. Again, in summary, there's many factors that you need to consider when choosing a water treatment supplier. I suggest you come up with a question or two that you know the answer to and propose those questions to your water treatment supplier. Do you get the right answer? Okay, Bill, uh, thank you very much. Let me just, uh, as I say, Bill and I had talked about these takeaways uh, before we came on air here. So here's today's takeaways. A sound water treatment program is one which uses both mechanical and chemical means. Bouncing water line in the boiler can be both system and water composition induced. Most often it is system related involving sudden pressure drops. A three element feed water system can help solve sink and swell problems in your boiler. Sink and swell, foaming and priming can lead to carryover, which can lead to water hammer. Water hammer is not normal. It must be remedied. Important to check for corrosion and scale, and if evidence, check your log against the, uh, that of the water treatment professional that you have engaged. And regularly documenting the chemical logbook is essential for a reliable program. Light scale in or on the boiler tubes is no longer considered wise for boiler protection. Cost of fuel is just too much. Look for evidence of boiler chemicals in the condensate. Could be a sign for carryover. Laying a boiler up wet or dry is largely dependent on the amount of time the boiler will be offline. And the key factors to consider when choosing a reputable water treatment expert are education, expertise, and cost. And now it's time for some questions. Susan?